Okay, here we have a couple of FRQs about polynomials. Okay, so in our first one here, we're given this function. Okay, so here's your function. It is a third degree or a cubic function. And we're first act to fact, uh, asked, asked to completely factor it by grouping. Okay, so I'm not going to rewrite it, bless you, but you should know that in grouping we want to put parentheses around the first two things and parentheses around the second two things. Okay, and then we come to ourselves and we say, okay, what do these things have as a common factor? Right? What do x cubed and 3x squared have as a common multiplier? And hopefully you can see that they have an x squared as a common multiplier which means I have an x plus 3 left over, so I put that in parentheses. And then we come to our next grouped thing, a minus 25x and minus 75, and ask, what do these two things have in common? And they have a minus 25. Okay, so if, if this term, if your x value has a minus in it, then you will always have a minus as what they have in common. Okay, so that means we're going to change the sign of what's left on the inside. So if we pull out a minus 25, that means we have an x plus 3 left over in parentheses. Okay, so now we're looking at one term, right, that's a product, and one term that's another product. Both of these terms have x plus 3 as a common multiplier. So because that is true, we are able to further factor out the x plus 3. Okay, so both of these get factored out as one single thing, and we have an x squared minus 25 left over. Okay, so then the question becomes, can you further factor this quadratic here, this difference of squares? Yes. And the answer is yes, we can. What numbers multiply to give you negative 25 and add to give 0? Those are minus 5 and plus 5. Okay, so we have now successfully rewritten our polynomial, right, which was in standard form to factored form by grouping. Okay, moving on to part B, it says use synthetic division, so they are telling us how we're going to do this by using synthetic division to show that x plus 3 is a factor of the function. Okay, is a factor. So that takes us, and then explain, explain why. So we have to use some words. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. If we use synthetic division and our thing is a factor, what do we expect? Expect to get a remainder of 0. Okay, so that's what we're trying to look for. We are looking for a remainder of zero. Right, that is our conceptual understanding. If it is a factor, we will have a remainder of zero. Yes. So first we take your x plus three and we set it equal to zero because we need to figure out what number we're going to use with our synthetic division. So if x plus three is a factor, that means negative 3 is going to be your root. So we're going to do synthetic division on your polynomial. Right? So we have 1x cubed, 3x squared, minus 25x, and minus 75. Those are the numbers that are going to go into your um, synthetic division here. Plus 3, minus 25, minus 75. And I don't really need to have a plus 3, so I'm going to erase that. So let's do our synthetic division. Okay, we drop down the 1. Negative 3 times 1 goes right here. All right, so that's negative 3. And then we add 3 minus 3 is 0. And then we multiply negative 3 times 0, and that goes here which is 0, of course, so then we still add, and negative 25 plus 0 is negative 25. And then we multiply that by negative 3, and that goes over here. And that's a positive 75, and we get a 0 remainder. 
right? So there's your work, right? It says explain why your work shows that it is a factor. Okay, so we're going to do something about this, right? Saying something about getting a remainder of zero because that's what is going on here. That's what's true. Okay, bless you. Let's figure this out right now. Okay, by the factor theorem. Okay, we took a minute on homework 20 and we talked about the remainder theorem and the factor theorem. Okay, hopefully they're still in your notes. But if you use synthetic division and you get a zero remain remainder, that means the poly, the, the linear is a factor. Okay, so by the factor theorem, x equals negative three is a root of the polynomial and x plus 3 is a factor. Okay, so the remainder theorem says if you get a remainder of 0, then you have a root. Okay, so it's about getting a remainder of 0. We have shown that we have a remainder of 0, so we have invoked the factor theorem. Okay, part C says, based on your results from part A. So what did we show in part A? Hmm, we showed that there were three factors. One was x plus three, one was x minus five, and one was x plus five. Right, that's what we did in part A. So based upon those results, what specifically, what can be specifically determined about the graph? Okay, so we're asking about the graph. So what do we know about the graphs? Right, three things about graphical behavior. We know that the graph either crosses, the graph bounces, or the graph flattens, right? Those are our three things about the graph that we know. And all of this is based upon what? Math. Math, what kind of math? Good. The multiplicity. All of these things are based upon the multiplicities. Right? The graphical behavior at a certain x value is all based upon the multiplicity. Okay? So what is happening at x equals 3? So at x equals negative 3, the graph will do what? The graph will do what? That's what we're asking. What will the graph do? Will it cross, will it bounce, or will it flatten? What do you think? The graph will cross, cross the x-axis, right? Because x plus 3 has a multiplicity of one. Right, so the multiplicity of each of our factors, the multiplicity of the roots, all come from the power okay, of the factor. Now, if we look up here, we don't see any numbers, right? There's nothing up here as a power for any of these factors, which means that they all have a power of 1. Okay, so each of these has a multiplicity of 1, and if it has a multiplicity of 1, then the graph is going to cross at the x-axis. So we say... It crosses because it has a multiplicity of 1. Okay, That is the full reason about what's going on on the graph. Our last one is another synthetic division problem. We want to know what value of k in this equation makes x plus 2 a, a factor. Okay, so what do we know? What is the remainder like if this is going to be a factor? The remainder has to be 
zero. Okay, so we're gonna set up and solve this synthetic division problem and see what we get for a remainder of zero. So let's do that. Here's our synthetic division. If I were to solve x plus two equals zero, that means x equals negative two. Okay, so then what are the numbers inside of your division house? Well, we have negative three x cubed. Um, we have zero x squared. So we have to put a zero in there for x squared. We have a k value for x, and then we have a minus two. And we want to have our remainder. So whatever is down here, whatever that happens to be, our remainder needs to be equal to zero. So chances are that's gonna be some type of an equation with k that we can solve. Okay, so let's see what we do here. Okay, let's do this thing. First, we drop down your minus three. Negative two times negative three is positive six. We add and we get six. Negative two times positive six is minus 12. And we add and we get k minus 12. Okay, so here we have ourselves an equation, right? We can't add letters and numbers together. So we write them down as an equation. And then we multiply these both by negative two. So we have to multiply the k value by negative two and the number. So we get negative two k plus 24. That is the key to getting these right. You have to multiply your k and your number. So we have a negative two k plus 22 equals zero. Okay, so now we can solve this equation for k. 2k equals 22 and k equals 11. So this is the key part, is that we don't get 12k when we add k and 12. You can't add letters and numbers, but they can live together as neighbors. And then you multiply both pieces, the k, the k times negative 2 and the minus 12 times negative 2, and then we add and we solve. And that's how you do that. Okay, let's swing over here and look at the second one, then this is FRQ number 12. And we're given some information, so let's look at the information. We have a cubic function. So you should know what a cubic function is, right? That's something raised to the third power such that here's a point, right? When x is negative three, the y value is two. Here is a second point. When x is negative one, the y value is negative three. And here is a third point. When x is four, the y value is negative three. Okay, so they're giving us three points that are on this cubic function, right? We don't know what the equation for that cubic function is, but we know that it has those three points. Additionally, there's only two distinct zeros, okay? So that means it only crosses or touches your graph twice. Not three times, not once, but twice. And those happen to work between negative three and positive four. Okay, so both of these things cross the x-axis or touch the x-axis on that interval. Okay, part A says, what's the domain and range of f of x? Okay, f of x is a cubic, so you need to know that the domain and the range are both all real values. Okay, domain and range are both. That is a uh, property of all polynomials. Okay, all polynomials have all real domains and ranges. All reals, you can cube any number you can raise any number to the fifth power. You have all possibilities when you're doing polynomials. So the domain and the range are all reals because it is a polynomial, because it's a cubic, right? No other reason whatsoever other than the fact that it's a polynomial. So the second one says, state the multiplicities of the zeros. Well, we don't have anything that's factors, right? We have no parentheses, so we have no powers. So we have to think about this conceptually. Okay, so remember this concept. 
the sum of the multiplicities is equal to the degree of the polynomial. Okay, so we know that this polynomial has two zeros, right? Just two. It says it has only two. So the multiplicities of those have to add up to three because this is a cubic function. And it can't have a multiplicity of 1.5, and it can't have a multiplicity of zero, which means one of these has to have a multiplicity of one, and the other one has to have a multiplicity of two. So one is gonna be a cross, because that's what happens with a multiplicity of one, and the other one is gonna be a bounce on the graph, because that's what happens with a multiplicity of two. Okay, so those are the multiplicities. One of them is a one, and the other one of them is a two. Because with only two zeros, they have to add up to be three, and that's the only way that they can add up to be three is if one is one and the other one is two. So moving on to part C, explain why f of x is guaranteed to have a zero of multiplicity one. That means the graph is gonna cross, right? Just like we said up here, we have to have a multiplicity of one. But now this is saying that it's gonna happen explicitly between negative three and negative one, okay? So let's come down here and look at the graph, right? Part D says sketch a possible sketch. So let's go ahead and fill in some of this information that we know, okay? We know that the point was ne negative three, positive two, right? This was given to us in your beginning. That was a point. Negative one, negative three is a point and positive four, negative three is a point. So this next question is, or part C said, why does there have to be a crossing? Why does the graph have to cross between negative three and positive one? Okay, so this from our notes yesterday goes back to the existence of a zero idea. The existence of a zero. Okay, so if our graph is positive on the left side of your interval and negative on the right side of the interval, right, there's no other way to get from a positive number to a negative number than to go through zero. Right? You can't jump over zero. It has to happen. Okay, so that's the existence of a zero. So let's go ahead and, and prove this mathematically. Right? So we're going to say that that's really... That's really thick there, so let's make it smaller. The y value at negative three is positive, right? It's a positive y value at negative three, and it is a negative y value at negative one, right? So we have a positive two and we have a negative three. Those are positive and negative values. Then the graph, because we're talking about the graph, explain my f of x, then, then the graph must cross the x-axis between those two x values, between x equals negative three and x equals negative one. Okay, so that's the existence of a zero or the existence of a root. If it's positive on the left interval and it's negative on the right interval, that means it has to be zero somewhere in between. Okay, and when it's zero, that means that it's crossing the x-axis. Right, and that's what it means to have a multiplicity of one is that the graph crosses the x-axis. So then the last thing is our sketch. So we've already got some of it sketched. Okay, we know that it has to cross between negative three and negative one. And we know that it can't cross again, but it has to touch. It has to have another zero. So that means the graph has to bounce. So it's going to come up, and it's going to touch, and then it's going to go back down. Okay, and it doesn't really matter where, right? It says sketch a possible graph. So we don't know exactly where that touches the x-axis. We just know that it does touch it somewhere on the positive side of x. Okay, so that's what your graph could look like. There are other possibilities. Of course, it's not an exact science. It says sketch a possible graph. So here are some of your FRQs, your free response questions that deal with polynomials. 
Hopefully that's better and your brain is amazing. Goodbye.